Hello and welcome to the Ropescast, the independent voice of the Middle East. I'm Ibrahim Abu Ahmad. And I'm Ksenia Svitlova. ROPES stands for the Regional Organization for Peace, Economics, and Security. We work to lay the groundwork for a post-conflict Middle East by connecting forward-thinking Israeli and Palestinian emerging leaders with like-minded peers from across the region. If you are looking for more information about ROPES, please visit our website, ROPES.org. Our very special guest today is Muhammad Darausha. Muhammad Darausha is a director of strategy at the Center for Shared Society at Givat Chaviva. He is a Robert Bosch Academy Fellow and faculty member at the Hartman Institute. Muhammad also worked as co-director of the Abraham Initiatives and served as election campaign manager at the Democratic Arab Party and United Arab List. Darausha gave lectures at the US Congress, the EU and NATO, among others. He is also recipient of the Peacemakers Award from the Catholic Theological Union and the Peace and Security Award of the World Association of NGOs. Without further ado, let's bring our guest. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on our uh, podcast. And we would love to start with you by asking you to share with our audience and our listeners just a little bit about your work in uh, Givat Haviva over the years. And how did things change since the beginning of the war? Uh, how did you respond to the war as a community and as an initiative? And what are the things that you were focused on today? Well, thank you, Ibrahim and uh, Ksenia. It's a great honor to be with you. Uh, actually, Givat Haviva is the first peace education center, in not just in Israel, but in the Middle East. Uh, already founded in 1949, and in 1963, created the first Jewish Arab Center for Peace. Uh, with a very basic layer of education for peace, which is uh, what's called the social contact theory, bringing Jewish and Arab students to meet with each other, to break stereotypes, where you expect the result to be humanization of the other side. Uh, we did that with teachers, we did that with neighboring uh, uh, Arab and Jewish mayors uh, and uh, women groups and business leaders. With time, uh, the programs evolved. Uh, we developed the dialogue uh, arm. So it's not just to come and enjoy each other, other's company, but to also engage in dialogue where you can discuss the differences, where you can discuss also where you disagree and ultimately agree to disagree. You know, we, we're still in, a, in an active conflict that uh, does not really allow us to speak about post-conflict narratives. Uh, we're still stuck with the historic narratives, uh, which is a dialogue that is necessary, a, a dialogue that is important to have because this way we know what are the components of each other's identity. We do that with high school students. We do that with the leadership uh, groups. It's not an easy work to do because it's a dangerous business because from a, a narrative debate or that kind of dialogue, it uh, highlights usually the differences. You need to be able to wrap up such a meeting and not just to open such a meeting. Opening such a meeting is very easy, but wrapping it up and uh, doing the closure of it uh, needs a great deal of uh, professionalism in which we specialize. Actually, for, for the work we've done in this field, we received the UNESCO Prize for Peace Education. We're the only organization, again, in the Middle East that has that kind of quality control or quality certificate. Uh, with time we evolved and that's around 2005, uh, we evolved into a third uh, a theory in conflict resolution, which is uh, called the superordinate goal theory, basically focusing on mutual interests and mutual goals of, uh, of people that come in and engage in our programs. So we started looking at how do we bring down the obstacles in front of Arab students to enter universities? How do we break down obstacles to enter civil service? Uh, how do we break obstacles to enter the jobs? Uh, and then the question is, how do you train the Arab citizens with the skills needed to work in a civil, in an Israeli Jewish society? But also, how do you uh, make sure that that host population is a welcoming population? So that's the typical work of Givat Haviva. Uh, during such uh, a crisis, uh, we're facing a, a lot of damage that is happening to our field. 
uh, and we go into the mood of crisis management. And in crisis management, it's uh, to prevent the accumulation of damage that might prevent us from being able to continue our work the day after the war. Uh, so meanwhile, we're trying to make sure that we stay in touch with our partners. That's the principals of the schools we work with. That's the, the mayors of the towns we work with to keep calm, to keep uh, the, the tension with at the lowest rate possible. But at the same time, also to critique the government actions to make sure that certain actions do not bring about escalation, do not lead uh, towards escalation in, in, uh, in Jewish Arab relations in Israel. We, we also uh, try to focus a great deal on uh, working with employers and working with uh, uh, students. For now, we know on the 3rd of December, that's that's a date that is worth watching. The 3rd of December, universities are going to start. 20% of the student population are Arab citizens who have different perspective about the war going on. And almost half of the male Jewish population in the universities are now soldiers in the war. And they're going to come back with a great deal of militarization in their hearts and minds, uh, uh, viewing our, uh, Arabs in general as that being on the other side of the gun. Uh, and they come with that experience to the universities where they're supposed to be equals with Arab students. So we're so working now you, on this regard, issue. I, I'm sorry I'm interrupting you, but I wanted to ask you, do you think that you have enough tools? Do you think that all of the amazing work that you've done so far can help you to basically lead um, and neutralize potential conflicts and to uh, you know to create some kind of dialogue uh, in this uh, environment? That's a good question, Xenia. Thank you for asking it. First of all, we're not alone in this field. Uh, there are additional 180 organizations active in this field. We know that we have more duties because we're the biggest in the field. Uh, in the uh, youth encounters, for example, we run almost 60% of the volume of youth encounters between Jewish and Arab youth, which means that we had to develop over the last few decades all the needed skills to manage this situation. We learned from, uh, uh, from past experiences. We learned from October 2000 clashes uh, in which, uh, uh, which left Arab and Jewish citizens apart from each other. Uh, there was so much damage created, including what we call mutual boycott of both communities after that period. Uh, we refer to the ten, the 10 years afterwards as the lost decade in Jewish Arab relations. And uh, uh, as such, uh, one of the one of the uh, tools that we one of the uh, 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 intellectual results that we learned from there was that you, during crisis, you do not duck until the wave leaves or until the wave passes. Mm -hmm. In the contrary, this is the time to stand up and keep your vision still alive in the press, in the media, and you see us very, very active in, in the public uh, arena uh, because people usually ask you, where were you during the problem? So you need to legitimize, in order to legitimize your work the day after the war, the war you need to be present with your messages during the war. So the second thing is to train the staff and train the potential facilitators. So we're doing a lot of training right now. So we're not going to start training the day after the war. We actually come ready and we've already done a couple of pilots of working with uh, uh, students to see what actually works. So skill wise, we think we, we have the skills, we have the tools. The question is the scaling. And for the scaling, we need two things. One is we need the partnership of other fellow organizations to share some of the burden. And second, we need the financing, which is not going to be available. You know, we work with about 10, 12,000 participants every year. Starting the day after the war, we need to probably work with 120,000 people to try to reduce the damage so that it doesn't take us 10, 10 years to heal the damage that we are accumulating right now. But it takes us maybe, we can rebound into normal relations within maybe a year or two and not within 10 years after the war ends. And I would like to just follow up on that. Uh, uh, as you mentioned, your uh, training for your uh, staff, how do you deal with the tensions that could be also created within within the team? That's also something that's, you know, could happen. Uh, people have different views, different opinions. How do we keep, how do you keep the staff together, united in, under one vision? 
and what Despite kind of the differences that naturally can uh, erupt absolutely, absolutely. and uh, you know maybe that would be a tip to our listeners because they a lot of them come from abroad and we see that the conversation abroad is becoming very black and white so what kind of tips can we maybe give to people everywhere to to have a discourse i mean first of all talk you know uh, more staff meetings we usually have one staff meeting every week now we have three staff meetings a week uh, to widen the spectrum of space for us to share ideas and share perspectives and we bring very different perspectives i'm exposed to information that my israeli jewish colleagues aren't exposed to uh, and it's important for them to understand what media i consume what images i'm exposed to what pain i'm exposed to which they're not exposed to they're exposed to one side of their pain which is the jewish pain of what happened in october 7th which reminds them of pain that happened in the Holocaust, which, you know, it, it becomes folds and folds and, and layers of, of pain. And it's important for them to understand where we also, what we also see uh, as Palestinian uh, staff members. We also bring the Palestinian pain to the table and we legitimize it. And it's important to allow this discussion to happen. Uh, not that much to actually engage in a narrative debate on who did what to whom, not to engage in a ping pong uh, a debate to try to settle on one truth, but to quickly shift into professional mood. We have a mission. We have a job to do. This is not the time for us to uh, uh, break apart and then lose our potential clients that we're supposed to tailor with. We're supposed to be the the strong anchor that when the teachers and the principals of the schools that we work with, the mayors that we work with, we convened already three mayors meetings in our campus. They need to know that we are stable. So sometimes that stability is is maybe not 100 percent, but you need to show 100 percent towards the outside. Inside, you need to allow space for disagreements. You need to allow space for a, 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 a discourse that might not be pleasant sometimes. Uh, I know that this discourse broke apart more than 100 organizations in the early 2000, after the October 2000 clash, clashes, more than 80% of the organizations broke apart because of that tension. And uh, few managed to survive. And those that managed to survive are the ones that are not just based on goodwill but the ones that are based on professionalism. Goodwill might be broken during, or might be challenged dramatically during time of tension and during time of crisis. People lose faith in such a time. And if you have professional skills and you think that you're able, you know what's your main target. Your main target is to try now to ease tension and not to be part of the tension, to reduce the uh, confrontation not, and not to be part of the confrontation. So if you allow yourself to get dragged, clearly you're not professional. If you see the bigger prize, then you will control yourself and say, okay, I have a bigger job to do than just to bring myself into a debate. Muhammad, I'd uh, like to use the little time that we still have. We understand that you are crazy busy right now um, about uh, your personal emotions. I understand uh, that uh, you lost a loved one from your family uh, in the horrific atrocities of Hamas on uh, October 7th. And um, at the same time, you know, you are handling this whole operation and you are talking about still about peace, uh, about coexistence. You know, this is something that you have been doing all your life. Uh, And yet, you know, you are suffering today, uh, just like thousands of other Israeli families. Uh, you are part of the family of grief, you know, so to say. Uh, can you, you know, walk us a little bit through these complex emotions? Uh, well, actually, uh, it was surprising to fall into this trap of being part of the grief family. It, it just happened, and I assume it happens to everyone without knocking on your door. But uh, our door got knocked on October 7th, very early in the morning, when uh, my cousin Awad, who was a paramedic at the Supernova party, in the south which was attacked and uh, he he took a very brave decision not to evacuate the scene and to stay there to uh, care for the wounded and he thought that because he was able to speak arabic he would be spared 
and uh, that he will manage uh, to negotiate at least his own survival so that he can try to help people. He was shot and killed, and uh, we didn't see, we didn't get the body until six days later. So it was very long six days, which wow. also with the following uh, three days of mourning, uh, the form of three days of mourning, were very difficult to the family and to the uh, town and uh, to the whole Arab community. But uh, quickly, uh, you know, you use the term Xenia grief family. Quickly, I also realized that I have also Jewish friends that lost uh, their, one lost their uh, uh, daughter and her boyfriend, another lost uh, his nephew, uh, another lost his son. And these are close friends. These are people that I'm usually in touch with them once a week. These are people that uh, come to my house uh, uh, two, three times a year. I go to their home two, three times a year. And suddenly uh, you see that you're part of a collective that is sharing that grief. It's not easy. Uh, it's difficult, actually, not just not easy. Uh, and uh, it's challenging because uh, you, you feel that, okay, I've been doing all of this work to my li all my life. Why do we deserve uh, to pay the price of the war? Uh, but you know, at some moment, you wake up and you say, well, if I don't do it, then the next cousin might fall. It could be on October 7, 2025 or 27. Uh, and that's why we really need to try to prevent the next, next casualties. And it gets more difficult because, I, you know, when you see the bigger picture of grief also now on the Palestinian side, uh, then the tension, the, your feelings become much more uh, a challenge. Uh, you feel that sometimes your little work of peace education cannot stop that tsunami of the war. Uh, and uh, sometimes it's frustrating. Uh, sometimes you say, okay, uh, do I have enough reasons to wake up and go to work tomorrow? Uh, but then you remind yourself, if I don't do it, who's going to do it? You know, uh, we can't, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a father to four and a grandfather to a little four-month-old uh, granddaughter, and I, I feel the responsibility to give them better reality than the one uh, we have today, uh, which means go beyond your feelings of sorrow and agony. Remember uh, our cousin Awad as a brave hero and move on, uh, not to get stuck in your sorrow and, and grief. We just on the behalf of the ROPES team, I would like to say that we, of course, offer our condolences and uh, Ale Rahmo, Awad, uh, is from uh, everything that we know, died indeed as a hero. He died saving people, saving human lives, uh, and we will forever uh, remember him. He, I mean, he he left us with with that memory of humanity until the last minute, and also professionalism until the last minute. He, when they found his body, he still had bandages in his hands that he was trying to put on on wounded people's uh, on their wounds to stop. They're bleeding. Uh, that's the image that we remember of him. You know, uh, Howard is a, a hero of the, the Ravshe family, but also for me, I see him as a hero of the whole Arab uh, citizens of Israel and all of the state as well, not just... For and, and especially the medical uh, industry, Ibrahim, because as we speak right now, a third of the medical staff in Israel are Arab citizens. 24% of the doctors, 44% of the nurses, and 55% of the pharmacies. Where are they, are they now? They are in their shifts, doing their jobs, fulfilling their medical oath of uh, being human uh, and uh, treating people as equals. And I think that's the humanity that is probably missing among our leaders on both sides. You know, I, I think that uh, the, those small stories of light, I would call them, which are happening every day, it's the Arab taxi drivers in Tel Aviv. It's the uh, bus drivers who are meeting a lot of racism these days. I, I heard of news of lots of attacks, almost 90% increase in attacks against uh, uh, Arab drivers in uh, public transportation just the last week. The reports of how many Arab uh, 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 drivers were attacked, uh, attacks on uh, on Arab students and Arab employers. I mean, all of that is happening as we speak. So we're not living a rosy 
picture right now. We don't have a rosy picture. We have a very challenging picture in which we need to look at those uh, stories of, of light, but we need to remember we have a job today. Our job is not just to celebrate those small, important, good stories. Our role is also to try to block the radical extremes that are trying to set an agenda of confrontation. Uh, when I hear uh, uh, that uh, the Minister of Interior uh, Security, uh, Itamar Bengvir, is handing out uh, guns into Israeli, into Israeli Jewish society, uh, I'm afraid because I know that my four children are going to be on the other end of the gun. Uh, and I'm, I'm afraid that uh, the, uh, uh, the screaming and shouting of death to the Arabs, as we heard it in Netanya College, uh, will, might translate itself into more violent actions. Uh, we need to try to prevent the escalation in Jewish Arab relations inside Israel. Uh, that's our duty today. And I think those small stories maybe contribute to giving people some kind of a calming message. And that's why it's important to bring them out uh, today. So thank you for giving me the opportunity of sharing this with you. Um, dear Muhammad, you know, thank you so very much for joining us. Uh, before we will uh, say goodbye, we still want to use two minutes of your time. Uh, as a regional organization for peace, economics, and security, I want to ask you a question about the future of relations uh, between uh, Israel and the Jews and Arabs in it, uh, and uh, the you know the larger Middle East, because we did see some positive dynamics in the last few years, and uh, despite the war. Uh, some things were stopped, but it's not finished. You know, it's not uh, uh, it's not shut. Uh, we will resume, I believe, at some point. What kind of role do you think the region and the countries, the moderate countries in the region, should play uh, in the work of peace uh, in uh, in the Middle East? Well, it's hard to answer this in two minutes. But uh, if uh, if I will put my hat hat as uh, in my academic hat as a professional in the field of uh, conflict resolution. One of the first things that uh, when we teach students about conflict resolution, we say a conflict is an opportunity. Uh, with all of the miseries around it, a conflict is an opportunity. A crisis is an opportunity. It's an opportunity to reshuffle the deck and change the power structure so that uh, we know, for example, that the theory of bypassing the Palestinian issue failed. We know which, you know, the. The right wing said, we don't need to solve the Palestinian issue. Let's go to peace with Bahrain and peace with the Emirates. That failed. So that puts the Palestinian issue more significantly on the table right now and maybe forces a lot of more people to deal with this issue right now and not without delay. That's one thing. The other theory that uh, failed is what's, what's called conflict management mm -hmm. uh, as replacement for conflict resolution. We need to resolve the conflict and not to manage the conflict. The third theory that failed is how you deal with extremists. They used to, they used to use the policy of mourning the you know mourning the lawn. It's like cut the grass, don't let it grow too high. Well, it seems that you need to uproot it. Uh, whether it is the extreme radicals in the uh, uh, Israeli side or in the Palestinian side, the attacks that are happening right now also by the extremist uh, settlers uh, in the West Bank and Gaza and the ones that are trying to escalate the situation in Jewish Arab relations, they need to be met with much more significant restraining policy that limits their capacity almost completely from creating more damage. I, I, I remain hopeful, Xenia. I remain a, a believer that uh, the only path that was never tried, which is peace, maybe it's time to try it. We've come so close to it, and every time we get close to it, someone does a U-turn. We've never experimented it. We've never done it. And uh, we've always experimented the first Intifada, the second Intifada, the first Lebanon War, the second Lebanon War, and now the first uh, mega war of uh, uh, against Gaza. If we do not put an end, political, diplomatic end to the conflict immediately. As I said, September, uh, October 7th is right around the corner, corner next year and the following year. It's going to meet us again. And next time it might be with more velocity. It might be with more casualties. And we'll come back to square one. 
we need to resolve the diplomatic problem, the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, which every five rational people put in the room together will agree it has to be a two-state solution, more or less around the 1967 borders. Let's start by creating that framework and then work backwards. I think that the, the speed of a, a, what was called the pulses in the Oslo Agreement. Let, let's build peace, you know, small piece by piece. What's called pieces of peace. That theory also failed. We need to go from the bottom. Uh, for, we need two dynamics: the bottom up and the top down at the same time uh, uh, as we speak. We couldn't agree more with you, Muhammad. Thank you so very much uh, for your time um, and um, continue doing the good work that you are doing. And you keep doing your wonderful work also at Ropes. Thank you very much. You've been listening to the Ropescast, the independent voice of the Middle East. Our guest today was Muhammad Daraush, Director of Strategy at the Center for Shared Society at Givat Havima. We hope you enjoyed the Ropescast. Our podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, SoundCloud, and all quality podcast platforms. We are very grateful to all our listeners from the Middle East, Europe, the US, and other parts of the world. You can support our work by small donation. More details on our website at ropes.org. And please follow us on social media at ropes.org to find out more about our work with the emerging leaders of the Middle East. I'm Ibrahim Abu Ahmad. And I'm Ksenia Svetlova. Shalom. And salam. Salam.